This is a video on Big O notation. My name is Alan Doran. Before you watch this video, it's important, actually, it's essential that you go and watch the video on running time or time complexity. You need to understand these concepts if Big O notation is going to make any sense to you at all. So what is Big O notation? Well, a function g of n is order f of n if, and then there's an expression. Now, this O that you can see here is the big O. What we want to get is uh, an indication of the time complexity of the function g n, and that time complexity is represented in this big O notation. Now, what is it exactly? Well, what we're looking for is the existence of two constants k and l such that the time complexity of gn or the running time of gn is less than constant k times running time of function of n for all n greater than l. Now you're probably wondering what the hell that all means. Well, basically what we're looking for is an estimate of how the function g of n, where n is the input or the number of input values, how the function g of n behaves as n gets huge. So the constant l serves as a bottom marker, if you like, and for all n greater than l means as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, as long as it's greater than l, we want to know that this function provides an outer bound, that is it will always be greater when multiplied by constant k than the running time of the function gn. So in other words, g of n takes less time than k times the running time of the function of n. So n greater than l is just a way of saying n gets larger and it has some minimum for which this function will hold true and that is big L will be that minimum value. So what we're looking for or what this identifies for us is an upper bound on the complexity of gn. In other words, I'll try again, k times the running time of f of n is always greater than the running time of g of n. If we can find a case where there are constants k and l such that this is true for all n greater than l, then we know that f of n times a constant k will always take longer than g of n. Okay, so this upper bound on complexity ignores parts of the algorithm that are insignificant to the total running time. If you remember the video on running time, we looked at the time complexity of the binary search algorithm and the loop in the middle had seven operations in it. That loop turned out to be the dominant aspect of the running time of that algorithm and the parts that were in the white bands at the top and the bottom of the loop were insignificant. So this upper bound on complexity ignores those insignificant bits. If you can't remember what I'm talking about, go back and watch the video on running time and time complexity again. Now, again, this upper bound on complexity is supposed to give us an idea of the function's behaviour for large inputs, that is, for values of n greater than some constant l. Now, there are different types of complexity. We saw in the case of the binary search, uh, logarithmic complexity. But here's a list of several different types of complexity. So there's constant complexity, order 1, logarithmic complexity, order log n, linear complexity, superlinear, quadratic and exponential complexity, all of them listed here. Now these are listed in order of increasing time complexity. So the fastest algorithms are of constant complexity and the slowest algorithms are of exponential complexity. We'll look at each one of these in turn and provide some examples to give you a better feel for what they mean. Constant complexity. 
or to one. So in an algorithm with constant complexity, all instructions are performed a fixed number of times. For instance, if n doubles, that's the number of input values doubles, then the running time doesn't change, it remains constant. So example, randomly opening a book. No matter how big the book is, it takes you exactly one move to open it at a random page. That is an algorithm of constant complexity. It's independent of the number of pages in the book. Logarithmic complexity. We saw that this one applied for the binary search. So where a problem is uh, broken up into smaller and smaller problems, and each of these can be solved independently, then as in the case of the binary search, we're making the problem simpler each time by a constant factor. And the constant factor in the case of the binary search is a half. Now in this case, if n doubles, time complexity increases only slightly. So for instance, you can see here the phone book. It's divided for you into A to K and L to Z. And you start by picking a volume. Now let's suppose instead of those two volumes, we just had one big book, which was A to Z. It doesn't really change the problem very much. You would still open the book somewhere near the middle and then identify whether or not what you are looking for should be found in the first half of where you've opened the book or in the half of the book after the current page. So this is order log n. Linear complexity. In this case, each element requires a fixed amount of processing. That is, for instance, if we're reading pages in a book, we have to read each page, and we assume that each page takes the same amount of time to read. So if I have a book of length n, it will take me n minutes, let's say, to read it. If I double the number of pages in the book, then the time taken will now be 2n. Superlinear complexity. This is of order n log n. Now in this case, we find algorithms of this type of complexity include the merge sort. The problem is broken up into smaller sub-problems and each of these is solved independently. As before, each step cuts the size by a constant factor, but in this case, the final solution is obtained by combining all of the sub-solutions. So in this case, if n doubles, t gets slightly bigger than double. If you can't remember how merge sort works and why merge sort would be order n log n, go and watch the video on merge sort. Quadratic complexity, order n squared. We find algorithms of quadratic complexity typically where we're processing pairs of data items. For instance, we may have a double nested loop for i is naught to n, and inside that for j is naught to n. A double nested loop like this would typically be found in an algorithm of quadratic complexity. Now in this case, if n doubles, the algorithm takes four times longer. One example here given is if we have a party with n people and we've got a dance floor for a pair of people. If everyone dances with everyone else in a pair, we've got an algorithm of order n squared. That is, n people are dancing with n minus 1 other people, i.e. not dancing with yourself, and this n times n minus 1 gives us an algorithm of order n squared. Exponential complexity is specified order 2 to the n. For instance, uh, we usually associate this with what are called combinatorial explosions. In this case, for instance, if n doubles, then the time taken is squared. If n triples, then the time taken is cubed. So there's an example illustrated here. Supposing we've got a biological cell or some other data structure in a computer program, and every one of these cells at every time step divides to make two new cells. So if n is 1, we might have two cells. If n is 2, we would have four cells. If n is 3, we would have eight cells. If n is 4, we have 16. So 2 to the 2 is 4, and then if we double n, we say 2 to the 4, we've got 16. That is, we've increased here by the square. 
you can see how quickly exponential complexity grows. Or you can see how quickly the time taken by an algorithm of exponential complexity grows, I should say. So in summary, Big O notation provides an upper bound on the time complexity of an algorithm. Here are, again, the list of different types of complexity in increasing order. That's it for Big O notation. Thanks for watching.